When I was 10 years old, Chernobyl blew up. Over Chernobyl, there was this cloud filled with rain, and a cloud came to where we lived and rained nuclear fallout all over our garden, our neighborhood, everything. As a consequence, I couldn't play outside in the garden for more than a year. We couldn't eat any of the produce, any of the salad that we had in our gardens. And my dad was running around with his Geiger counter in everybody else's garden and in the um, kindergarten of my sister to figure out where it was safe. And then the rise of the HIV AIDS crisis coincided with my puberty. That kind of mothered me, as you can imagine. So I had a really visceral feeling about global circumstances influencing me directly that I couldn't influence back. So I was interested in what, what can I change, what can I do? And if I look at the world today, it hasn't become better at all. We've just heard how we are bringing our planet to the brink of ecological collapse, which means that we're killing ourselves. That is not the future I want for my 10-year-old son. I'm curious about what we can do in order to prevent this on a fundamental level. I've been curious about this for the last 20 years at least, where I was building digital platforms and initiatives and companies and projects and encountering many, many people along the way. And what struck me was that none of them ever said, no, oh, I want to destroy the planet and I want to destroy our societies. Nobody ever said that to me. But still, we're acting like that. The people around me, they wanted to be happy. They wanted to be happy for their loved ones. Their loved ones should have a great life and a great future. And whenever I asked those people, so why aren't you doing the thing you know you need to do? Because everybody was telling me they knew what they needed to do. They always said, hmm, we're lacking the money. We cannot do the right thing because we don't have money. So for a long time, I thought, let's accumulate money as much as we can and then give it to those people because they know what to do and they want to have a good life for everyone. But then one day, a meeting here in Frankfurt changed my perspective on this forever. It literally blew my mind. And I want to share what I learned in that meeting and how we can use this in order to think in new terms about the way we do economics on this planet and save the planet in the process. So in this meeting, there was Ernst Welteke. At the time, he was still head of the Central Bank in Germany. And the other person was Bernard Lieter. He had been head of the Central Bank in Belgium and one of the architects of the introduction of the Euro. So these were people who really knew something about finance. And what blew my mind was they wanted to create a currency inside of Germany, a new currency, in order to help the people living in one region. And that blew my mind. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. But I learned from Bernard specif specifically in the years after that how a monetary system works and what we can do with it. And this is what I want to share. So money is created through debt. So whenever somebody needs money, we create money. We create debt. And that debt, on that debt, we put interest rates. And interest rates means that it grows over time. And the money supply in our economies is growing and growing. But money is not only that. Money is also trust. We need and want to trust this money. So for a long time, we had this big caves full of gold in order to create that trust. Then we ran out of gold. So in 71, almost 50 years ago, we decided to change this. We said, so instead of gold, we can use something 
we seem to be always creating more of? Basically, our GDP. So we attached our monetary supply to our GDP. And if you've ever wondered why our politicians, our news anchors, and everybody is constantly telling you about the GDP growth in your region, wherever you live, that's the reason. We need to grow that stuff, otherwise the money supply will end. But what does that mean? GDP that measures nothing but profit in a region over a certain amount of time. And once you stop making profit, because everybody has all the things they need, what can you do? You can increase the cycles. So this is why we now don't have one or two fashion cycles per year. Now we have 52 fashion cycles per year. If you ever wondered why you buy a new cell phone every two years, this is the reason. This is an open invitation for a systematic exploitation of our people, our societies, and the planet. Externalization of negative costs is a direct consequence of that system. But I promised something. I promised we, we can use this for something good, right? So let's see what else could money be. We learned that whatever we back our money with, we create more of. First gold, then GDP. So what would we want more of? Turns out, at the New Economics Foundation in London, they developed a beautiful little index, the Happy Planet Index, that helps us to make sense of this. It measures things like subjective happiness, ecological footprint per person, the GD index, and wraps that all into one coherent index that we can use to back our currencies. Now imagine Trump and Xi Jinping and Putin, the Saudis, us Europeans, getting together and deciding, oh, let's drop the GDP. Let's use the Happy Planet Index instead. But probably not going to happen. So what else can we do? The core of economics is cooperation. We work together to achieve things, right? It turns out that already 10% of the U.S. workforce are turning over $2 trillion in the form of cooperatives. People working together to solve a social societal need with a service or a product or infrastructure. So what if we could scale that? What if we could move that up from 10% to 100%? It's hard to do that, especially with cooperatives, because cooperatives are not interested in growth, like traditional companies, because traditional companies are more attached to the financial system than a cooperative. So there was a brilliant idea coming up a couple of years ago called platform cooperatives, which means that we put our cooperatives onto a digital space, much like Facebook or Google or all the other platforms you know. Great idea, right? Now you could put your cooperative onto something digital and have others copy it and scale it very easily. There's only one problem with it, and it's the same problem we know when we think about Alibaba, Facebook, and all the others. It's centrally owned. One or very few people own this stuff. So if we put our entire economic system in the form of cooperatives onto digital platforms, they will be owned by very, very few people. But this is the way out. When we started connecting computers, there was one computer in the center and many computers at the edges. Then we went on one more step. This is what we're doing right now. The internet. We connected these. Now we have these centers, connected centers, decentralized. So if we had something that looked more like this, then we would have the substrate we could put our cooperatives onto in a digital space 
Because in this system, there's no central owner. There's nobody who can have direct influence. Now, that system is already there since 10 years. Most people don't know about it, but everybody's heard about Bitcoin. Bitcoin to blockchain, which is what I'm talking about, is like email is to the internet. It's just one application. We can put a lot of other things onto this distributed system. So what I'm talking about is not my fantasy. There's a lot of experiments going on in the world right now. And I want to just run you through a couple of them at the moment. There's Radical Exchange, Ocean Protocol, Singularity Net, and others who are building the intellectual and technological infrastructure to build all of this. But there's also Kolu or Eva who build concrete implementations, concrete applications to do this. Kolu allows your local vendor to start selling you goods and services in a local digital currency. So you can effectively log out with your community out of the economic system right now, today. Or Eva come from Canada, they put Uber onto a distributed ledger, blockchain platform with a mobile front end. It looks like Uber, it works like Uber, but it's owned by the people. Or Parkspace, my friend Michael, he's building a village with 1,000 villas in order to create a physical space in which people can explore this new type of living. But these all are pretty big. And we don't want to wait, right? Because after all, this is about you, about us. This is our planet. We cannot wait. We cannot afford to wait for anybody. So what can we do today? Turns out, people have thought about that and they've solved it. Colony, Democracy Earth, or Aragon allow you to take your idea of a cooperative and put it onto a distributed system today. So there's no reason to wait or hold yourself back. Okay. So what have you learned? We've learned that everything we do in our economic system is based on money, money that grows by itself. And we back this with something that creates a negative incentive, an incentive to screw up the planet. And we've also learned an answer to this. If we use our common sense and the technology that's out there, we can do this. And we can build the future our children and our grandchildren deserve. Thank you.